Well, good morning. You will be turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 is where we're going to take a few verses that will serve as the outline for our uh, lesson this morning. It's good to be with you. We do have a good crowd this morning. I see some spots where some folks normally are. I know that there's a stomach bug going around. At least there's that and among other things that might be going around uh, right now. But we're glad for those of you that are here uh, with us this morning. As was mentioned, I am here this morning unsupervised. And uh, I don't know if I'll get in trouble with that or not. Um, but uh, just, you know, if I do, don't tell Karen. Um, but anyway, Randy's been sick since about uh, it was Friday afternoon, I think, was when he got sick. He was really sick overnight, Friday night. He's a little bit better this morning, but he was still running a fever. So Karen kept him at home and called the doctor. And he might go see her tomorrow if he's not feeling better. But anyway, I appreciate that. And you know, keep Randy in your prayers. Hopefully he'll feel better here in a day or two. Sometimes it just happens. <laughs> We've all been there at different points in time. So at the end of Matthew chapter 11, where I had you turn... We're continuing our study of the book of Matthew. We find here at the end of that chapter some very familiar words from Christ. Verses 28 through 30, we see that Jesus, He offers an invitation. Come to Me, all who labor. This is verse 28. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I believe this is one of those passages that is particularly meaningful for us as Christians. You know, even in our hymnal, I found at least three songs that center on the words of this passage uh, and use that as the focus for that song. And as we consider this invitation that we just read here at the end of Matthew chapter 11, in just th three short sentences, Jesus says so much. You know, this is an invitation that only God can offer. This is an invitation that was offered back when this was said back in Matthew chapter 11. But even for us today, this invitation, it's something that's available for us even this morning. So my question as we go through this, I want to ask several questions actually. Well, one, do we understand what he's offering here? You know, do we understand who this invitation, who it's being extended to? You know, do we understand what he's saying is expected of those that would accept this invitation? And then, of course, what is he offering to those that do accept this invitation? So let's think about this passage. Let's think about different thoughts that connect with these three verses as we continue our journey through the book of Matthew. So first, let's answer that question of who is this invitation? Who is it being extended to? In verse 28, Jesus invites who? He says, all who labor and are heavy laden. Who is he talking to? It's actually possible he could be referring to at least a couple of different things. I'm going to pick one this morning and we'll kind of run with that this morning. But it's possible of a couple of different things. For example, Kyle Pope, a comment that I read was that it was a suggestion that this passage could be talking about the burden, uh, reference to the burden of the, the burdensome version of Judaism that was prominent at this point in time that had developed after the return from captivity. What I have in mind is the version of Judaism that was practiced by the, the Pharisees, uh, the, the binding of the oral law and the traditions. In some cases, they would go beyond what the intention of the law was. So that's one possibility. But the one that I'm going to go with this morning is I was thinking about what Matthew chapter 1, when we were studying this, we referred to this verse. You remember in Matthew chapter 1, the angel was telling Joseph, he was telling him about Jesus that was to come. He says, He will save the people from their sins. That's Matthew 1 verse 21. So is it possible that when he's giving this invitation, the burden that he's talking about, is he talking about the burden that comes with sin? Then you ask the question, well, why is sin a burden? Hopefully we understand, but I want to think about a few points regarding this. I believe when we were studying Matthew chapter 1 back several, that was several weeks ago, several lessons ago, we referred back to Isaiah chapter 59. In Isaiah chapter 59, you remember, it talks about the fact that sin, it causes a separation between us and God. This passage also reminds me of another context where Jesus was teaching. I'm thinking of John chapter 8. He was teaching, he says in verse 31, he says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We all 
you know, probably remember that passage from that context. And you remember the response to that, that saying. He says, they wondered, how can we be free when we're not, you know, we're not slaves currently? But Jesus told them, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. That sounds like a burden, does it not? Sin is also a burden when one considers the penalty of that sin. Paul told the Romans, the wages of sin is death. That's Romans 6 and verse 23. Death is the penalty for sin. Now it's through Christ that we can have eternal life, but without Christ, our eternal fate due to sin is death. Just think of all the worry, all the doubt that comes with living a life of sin, especially with the thought without a Savior. Just thinking about this past couple of years that we've been through, I do not know how non-Christians have lived through this last couple of years in the heat of the pandemic with all the burden that comes with sin. Actually, I do know how they lived. You know, I'd say that I don't know how they lived, but I do. There was panic, there was worry, and there was fear. There was uncertainty of knowing what comes next particularly within my regards to eternity. I couldn't imagine. So if this invitation is for all of us that are burdened with sin, then according to the Scriptures, who is this invitation for? It is for every single one of us, even for those of us here this morning. Romans chapter 3, one of the things that Paul told the Romans, he says, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. In that same chapter, he later says in verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So this invitation, it was offered for those at that time, but it's also offered for us today. Any one of us that has sinned, which is all of us, we are all guilty of sin. So to accept this invitation that Jesus offers, Jesus calls for us to respond in in three different ways. First, He starts out in verse 28. He says, come to Me. We just talked about how this invitation is for all those that are burdened with sin. At least that's the, the way we're taking this passage this morning. Part of coming to Him is understanding the fact that we need Him. Part of coming to Him is accepting we have sinned. We have been slaves to sin. And we desperately need what it is that He's offering to us. And we come to Him for the solution to that problem. He says at the beginning of verse 29, He also says, Take My yoke upon you. What does He mean, take My yoke upon you? What is a yoke? Well, We know that a yoke is a reference to Typically, when I'm imagining it, this, I'm imagining this wooden harness that we usually put like on a strong, powerful animal. And typically what that means is when you put the yoke on, what's that gonna, animal about to do? Animal's about to do some work. Usually you know, used like with a plow or something of that nature. And this is interesting because we were just told Jesus is looking for who? He's looking for those that labor in our heavy laden. So this doesn't mean that those that are invited are about to be idle. In Jewish literature, the yoke was a symbol of servitude. Before Christ, what kind of servant were we? We were slaves of sin. We just talked about that. But when we accept Christ's invitation, again, that doesn't mean we're going to be idle. You know, thinking about that parallel, you don't put a yoke on an animal unless it's about to do some work. Christ expects us to labor, but He expects us to labor for Him. No longer a slave to sin, but a servant of His. And at a later point, we're going to see why this is preferable. He also says at the end of verse 29, he says, or, or later on in verse 29, he says, learn from Him. Or learn from Me, He says. Part of our service to Christ and part of our response to this invitation is that we are going to hear and we are going to accept His teachings. You know, We learn what His will is. We accept whatever obligations, whatever sacrifices that He would require of us. That makes me think of a couple of different parts of the Sermon on the Mount. We've already studied this more in detail, so I'll just read a couple of these to you. But in the Sermon on the Mount, it was quite clear those in the kingdom of heaven 
are going to be those that do His will. Not everyone who says to Me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of My Father who is in heaven. That's Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. And later on in that discussion, there's the discussion of the distinction between the wise and the foolish. Who's the wise? Well, the, my, the wise man is the one who hears the words of the Lord, not just hears them, but does them. Our acceptance of this invitation, it involves discipleship. What we're doing is we're committing our lives to learn from Him, to accept whatever obligations come with what He teaches. Now, that sounds difficult. But notice what he says there in verse 29. He says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. You know, often when the world views Jesus, those outside of Christ, often when they see Jesus, I think what they remember is they remember those instances like in Matthew chapter 21 where Jesus, He overturned the money changers, those that were buying and selling in the temple. And then they take that one story and they make a caricature of, of, of Jesus. To make him out to where God is just this angry being, overly angry. And that's not the Jesus that I read about in the Bible. Yeah, we'll study that. We'll talk about why that was just when we get there. But then you read of his life. We ought not make a caricature of that one story. When we read his life, I read of a man who was meek, he was humble. And I would say, if that wasn't the case, why? Would you have passages like Luke chapter 18 and verse 15 where parents, they were bringing their infants to Him. Actually, you remember that story that the disciples rebuked them at first, but what was His response? Let the children come to Me, He said. Do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of God. So far in our study of Matthew, I think of Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, where we read of a man, Jesus, He had compassion for those that were helpless. Going on also in verse 30, we're also told that this yoke that we're going to put on, Jesus says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. One thing I was coming across as I was studying this, apparently that word easy is, is the Greek word krestos, which when translated as it is, it could actually be potentially misleading. What I mean by that is we've already seen quite clearly, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, but even beyond that, we've already seen, is being a disciple of Christ, is it easy? No, we were told quite the opposite. We were told in Matthew chapter 8, there is a cost to discipleship. There are going to be tough sacrifices that a child of the Lord has to make to follow Jesus. We were told in Matthew chapter 7, what? That the path to life was what? It was narrow and it was hard contrasted to the path that leads to destruction. That word that I was mentioning just a second ago is translated easy in most translations, but it's also used in the sense of being useful or being better. Maybe we'll make clarification on what we mean by that here in just a second. Yes, we are called to be His disciples. We are called to learn His will. We are called to do as He wants us to do. But the point is, is that serving Christ, it is far preferable in contrast to being a slave to sin. Because as we said earlier, there is a great burden that comes with sin. It separates us from God. It's deserving of death. There is no true peace that comes with the life of sin. But to serve Christ, we've been taught it will result in eternal rewards. Mark Copeland in his notes on this passage, I was taking a look at his notes, he referred in this particular passage to what John says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. And his observation in 1 John 5 and verse 3 was that John was writing this and our understanding is likely he was very advanced in years at this point in time. The reason I mention that is because that means he had been a servant of Christ for decades at this point in time. He knew what it meant to be a servant of Christ. Yet he says in 1 John 5 and verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. I believe verse 30 that we're looking at right now, and then also John's comments in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, I think they offer for us a perspective of someone that understands the great blessings that are found in Christ. Yes, there is a cost to discipleship. 
Yes, there are sacrifices that we will have to make. But when you consider what Christ is offering, suddenly those things are not a burden. So let's talk about now what Christ is offering to us. Jesus offers us what this passage calls rest. I was thinking about that term rest. I always thought there was an interesting parallel between you know, the mention of rest here in Matthew chapter 11, but also how it was used for the Israelites, especially after the invasion and conquest of the land of Canaan. What I'm talking about is you remember at the end of the book of Joshua. So this is after they obeyed God, after they took the land with His help. Near the end of the book of Joshua, it says that the Lord gave them rest from all of their enemies. So for Israel, God gave them rest from their physical labor. They were going to be able to live in this land, this promised land. They were going to be blessed greatly if they would be obedient to Him. Was there a lot of work leading up to this? Yeah, there was a lot of work leading up to this. Was there work still yet to be done? Well, that's what the book of Judges points us to. But God was going to give them peace in the land as long as they were faithful to Him. But now, He is offering us rest. Let's see what He's talking about. He says in verse... 28, Come to Me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Note in this passage, verse 28 specifically, this rest is not something that we just earn. It's not something that we deserve. Jesus said that it's something He's going to give to us. And it's because of His offer that we can find rest. And I want you to think of the contrast here. He's asking them, Are you weary? Are you burdened? Jesus offers you rest. Think about how comforting of a statement that should be for them, but also for us. But also understand, according to verse 29, that this promise of rest is not regarding the physical. He tells us in verse 29 that He's offering rest for our souls. This promise, I believe, is regarding the spiritual. And that's not to say that spiritual peace can often, you know, it can often impact our physical well being as well, especially when you're thinking about mentally. It can certainly play a part in that. But what we're primarily thinking, I believe, in this passage is we're talking about the spiritual blessings that are found in Christ. For example, our guilt of sin is removed. Earlier we said, what was it? The wages of sin is death. How can there possibly be rest when that is hanging over our head? Paul says in Romans 5, verses 8-9, through but God shows His love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. And also I've got Romans 1, 8 and verse 1 on the board where Paul also said, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me read that one more time. There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. What a powerful statement. That sounds like rest to me. We also are taught in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, the peace of God will guard our hearts and minds. Paul told the Philippians in Philippians chapter 4, he was telling them they ought not be anxious for anything. They ought to take their cares to God. Specifically, he's talking about prayer in that passage. But then in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, he refers to what we just said, the peace of God. He says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Does that not sound like rest? I believe it does. Then also for us, there is the hope of eternal life. Turning your Bibles to Revelation 14 and verse 13. We're going to read this in just a second. But I would ask you this morning, thinking about this topic, what better assurance, what better comfort is there than Christ's promise of eternal salvation? Our souls, they find rest in that hope that is given by that promise of eternal life. Revelation was being written to Christians who were being persecuted or were about to be persecuted in the Revelation, it says in verse 13 of chapter 14, he says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. 
Blessed indeed, says the Spirit. Notice the end. That they may find rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Also think of another passage in John chapter 11. Jesus was talking to Martha after the death of Lazarus. And He said, He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in Me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in Me shall never die. What a promise. What a promise of comfort. And as He describes it, of rest. As we get to our conclusion this morning, the invitation that Jesus has offered here in this passage, it is an offer that is greater than anything than this world has to offer. It's an offer we can have confidence in. As we've talked about before, actually we talked about this, I believe Brother Douthat mentioned this Wednesday night. You know, the Bible doesn't teach us that if we serve Christ, we hope we might possibly be saved. It teaches exactly the opposite. John wrote in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. That's what the Scriptures teach. It is only through Christ, though, that we can find the kind of rest that we have talked about in this lesson. And again, that offer is to all that are guilty of sin. And again, that is every single one of us. But we've got to realize that. We must respond to His offer by seeking to do His will and by living as a reflection of the One who has offered us this invitation. But understand, as this passage teaches us, it's all worth it when you consider the spiritual blessings that are found in Christ. If you're here this morning, maybe you've accepted Christ's invitation already. Maybe you're a Christian this morning. What a passage of comfort. What a passage of encouragement that we find here in Matthew chapter 11. So maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you've not yet accepted that invitation. Well, I would ask you, why not? Because again, the world is not going to give you a better offer. This is the best offer that you're ever going to get here at the end of Matthew chapter 11. Right now, the invitation stands open as long as you have breath that you can still accept this invitation. But the time will come where that invitation will not be available anymore. So if you're here this morning and your life is not right with the Lord, let me encourage you to consider your soul. Consider that offer. Do whatever you need to do to get your right life right with the Lord. And if perhaps right now, if you desire the assistance of us here this morning, we would be glad to assist you. You're invited to come forward as we stand and as we sing.